can you talk a little bit about how you got here, your path to where you are today? Sure, yeah. So I, uh, I became interested in language very, very late. I became interested in language kind of all of a sudden when I was 17 years old. Uh, before that, I didn't really have any interest. Um, and so I started uh, studying languages on my own. I started studying French and Latin on my own. And then I, I took uh, German in high school in addition to AP Spanish. And when I got to uh, Berkeley for university, I discovered that there were a lot of um, a lot of language course offerings. So I, while I was there, I took Arabic, I took Russian, um, I took French formally, I took Middle Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs, uh, and I also was able to take a student taught class on Esperanto, which introduced me to the concept of uh, created languages. Um, oh, and I found let, it, let me stop you there for a second. You took all yeah. those simultaneously. No, I think the only ones that I took simultaneously were Arabic, Russian, and Esperanto. Uh, otherwise, it was just like a single semester of Arabic one semester, and then a semester of French one semester, and then Middle Egyptian one semester. So only three simultaneously. Doesn't it mess uh, with your mind because they have very different mentalities and uh, grammars? No. Yeah. no, they all have a no. They all have a different. They all have a different uh, space in my brain. Okay. So. Yeah, so it was it was really no big deal. Um, yeah, uh, so I was I was fine with that. But uh, one reason I stopped taking as many languages, which was a shame, I should have taken more. But uh, I I discovered linguistics. My mother thought that I would really enjoy uh, formal linguistics, so I took a course, and I, I really really liked it. Uh, yeah. And during that first linguistics course, I came up with the idea of creating my own language uh, just for fun, not for international communication like Esperanto. And, uh, and that was really it. The moment I came up with the idea, the moment I kind of gave myself license to be able to do it, I, uh, I started immediately. I started creating my first language in, in my notebook. And then... Um, How old were you then? 19. 19. Okay. Yeah, and then I just kept up with it while it continued to be fun, and so it's been, it's been twenty-one years now. Wow! So, um, do, do you know the book uh, "The Languages of Power"? It's a science fiction book written by uh, Jack Vance. By Jack Vance, indeed. Yeah, yeah I've read it. It's it basically it assumes that if you know so many seventy languages, uh, then you can manipulate, you can create new ideas that people with fewer languages don't really have, and you can use that to manipulate society. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, it is science fiction and nothing more. Um, the uh, the entire premise of <laughs> the languages of power is ridiculous, but, you know, it makes for, it makes for a nice book, I think. Okay. And did you know anyone else at the time who is interested in kind of the same thing? Uh, I came to meet people online, um, and I, I met, I, I think, two others in person. That was kind of something uh, while I was there at Berkeley. That was really cool. But uh, but mostly, no, I just found people online. Um, and even then, it took a while. It wasn't um, knowledge about, you know, created languages and stuff like that wasn't as widespread back then. So um, So it took me like six months to even find somebody who had heard of it um online but then i found an entire community um and you know after after a rocky introduction uh i came to really value and appreciate what they had done over the years and i learned a lot from them i think um i became the language creator i am today because of my interactions with that first uh conlang community learning how they do what they do and um, learning how I could be a lot better from what I was. Yeah. So where were they at when you came? Like, how much have they gone through? Did we already have people who spoke Klingon and stuff like that, or was it? Or well, these weren't right? people who were these weren't people who were uh, you know interested in learning uh, other created languages. These were people that were creating their own, okay. um, and there were. Uh, there was an entire spectrum of, of individuals. There are some who were brand new to the community, just like me. Uh, 
there are those who had been creating languages for 40 years by that point, um, you know, on their own. Um, most of them were fairly new to meeting one another online because, you know, the internet was still, this is uh, the year 2000, the internet was still, you know, not as common in homes. We so, were still coming um, off the VBSs and doing forums and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and so there were lots of people who had been creating languages for, you know, decades, but had never met another language creator in person or online. And so, uh, it was a really, it was a really interesting and really good time to be joining that community. And yeah, there's, so there was a huge breadth of, uh, everyone from total, totally inexperienced conlangers to those who had developed things that were really, really something to behold. Um, so it was a nice, a nice introduction. I'd like to take a few moments to, to let's assume most of the people listening are not people who invent their own languages. So I, I want to ask a few questions. If you don't like them, move on. Um, sure. Like, why, would, why do people do that, for example? And what happens to the languages once they invent them? Do they spread them around? Do they keep them? Do they have a secret language? It's it's different for different people. I mean, most of uh, the easiest answer is that they create languages because they enjoy them. They're still, uh, and they enjoy doing it. There's still some people that create languages with hopes that it will dethrone Esperanto and be the great language that everybody has to learn. Um, but there are fewer of those than there are people who do it simply for the joy of it. Um, and then in terms of what they do with the language, it really depends. There are some people that learn their own languages to fluency um, and, uh, you know, completely become completely fluent, whether it's for journaling or for using with themselves or using with a close friend. Uh, some people do that. Um, many have a project in mind. Either it's a... Uh, Either it's a book that has a fictional people that need to speak a language, or maybe they have a comic, like a web comic or, or a pen and paper comic. Some use it for artwork. Um, others, uh, you know, others have hopes that friends will learn it and then friends don't because, you know, friends are lazy and it takes a long time to learn a language. Um, others just put together grammars for the joy of it, share it with other language creators. Um, that, that was certainly what I did at the beginning. You know, I put them together I because I really, really loved it. And uh, and I put them up on a website so that others could look at them and see if they liked them as well. Um, and I enjoyed interacting with them that way. I still do. I like, I like looking at uh, what people come up with and looking at the grammars that they put together. Is there, did you get in all your ears any insight about how language was formed, because most of the languages we, you know, the old languages, the languages we uh, speak, uh, probably happened by, you know, natural steps, right? Someone needs words for apple, someone needs to put sentences together and slowly something comes, becomes a language. Uh, is there any insight from the way you create languages about how languages are probably created oh yeah i i think that i mean you actually had a very good description of it but it's like if learning about both you know studying linguistics creating languages and studying the etymological history of languages studying pidgin and creole languages has illustrated the fact that really what languages are is nothing more than linguistic analogy, really. You know, you start with one thing, compare it to something else, make a bit of a metaphorical extension, see if people pick up on it. If they do, it get, it's, it, it spreads and gets shared. Um, you know, there's actually very little invention, per se, that is just creating something that's brand new. Rather, what it is, most of the time, is taking what's already there and figuring out new domains of experience that it can be applied to, um, both in terms of the lexicon and in terms of grammar. Um, 
And this is what you see in language after language. Most of the time, it's not as if there is a special form or grammatical form that has one purpose and one purpose only. Instead, it has a basic purpose, and then it's extended to other similar purposes, right? And extended um, in ways that make sense within the context of the language and is put in a way that's potentially learnable by other human beings, because if it weren't learnable, then it wouldn't spread, you know? Um, and so when it comes to creating a language, I lean into that more than anything else. Many be beginning language creators think, well, here's a form, I must create something new. Here's a word, I must create it brand new. And it's like, most of the time we're not doing that. I mean, there's gotta be something to start with. So there is going to be invention, right? There has to be, but that should be the last resort, the absolute last resort. If what you're trying to get at is something human, you know, something that's new and unique, but plausibly human. Instead, you got to do it the way that we do it, which is just natural and gradual extension using what we have to make something new. So getting the, the, the babies basically absorb language very quickly. Would they absorb any kind of language that makes sense? Since what you say basically is it, it just has to make sense within its own uh, rules, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and they and they would. So it doesn't matter if it was a created language or a natural language. But um, I have a, a five and a half year old right now, so I've witnessed this up close, and um, this may sound a bit uh, controversial, but really, what babies do—it's nothing very remarkable, um, because they have tons of time, well, like more than enough time than they would need, and make so many mistakes. Like they, they, they make leaps of logic that are very interesting and often quite wrong. And it takes a long time for them to unlearn them. Uh, you know, eventually they do. And sometimes they don't and language will gradually change. But um, I mean, uh, it's, it's actually a very slow process, comparatively speaking. Um, very slow, very haphazard. Um, and there are some things that, uh, where it's like they, you know, a baby will, or, you know, a toddler will apply their logic that won't necessarily work for a language, um, or for the language that they're learning. Um, and that will hold for some time. And, you know, it's interesting. You, uh, there, there, you know, there's this idea of universal grammar. There's some basic grammar in everybody's head. And I think that's totally false. Um, but, um, but every so often it's like you'll see that they have hit upon a pattern that makes sense to them and they they really have a hard time letting it go so for example my daughter um thought that it made much more sense to put modifiers after the noun and say like the car gray um just because she thought that's in her head she thought this is how it makes sense you talk about whatever the thing is and then some characteristic about it she thought that made more sense than the other way. And so she would do that for a long time and still does it every so often, just flips the order of the noun and the adjective. She's a complete monolingual English speaker. There's, it's not influenced from some other language. It was just her idea. Um, and it'll take her a bit to, to let go of that. She probably won't be doing that in another year or so. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting, but um, I don't know. I don't, I don't hold the idea that it's some miracle. No, I wasn't going for a miracle. I was going, do we have yeah. pathways already ready that grammar just fits into it? Or, or do we learn the grammar from any kind of grammar as long as it makes sense? I think that it probably is learn in conjunction with our ability to reason and analogize generally, you know, looking at like the type of thing with, you know, baby's toys where it's like you have a bunch of different uh, blocks that have specific shapes and you need to figure out which shape goes in which 
hole. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, they can't figure that out at first. Eventually they do figure it out. And then eventually it becomes really simple. It's like, of course the star thing goes in the star hole where it's like, well, <laughs> a year and a half ago, you thought that was quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's kind of the the same thing i don't know i see it as the same progression really i mean uh certainly our 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 brains are such that you know and just kind of the way that natural evolution works the more humans you know come along it's like it gets it, it is better prepared to do that level of analogy i am not necessarily convinced that it is unique um that there's anything unique about language in there uh there might there might be uh not just because it's made things easier over the years but i don't know a dedicated center that's just for language for nothing else i i sincerely doubt it i do i just had this thought because of what you said do we know anything about the way animals who can speak like you know, we can teach some monkeys to speak, um, to use language. Um, in, are they very different from us? Well, it depends uh, if you're asking that of a linguist if, or if you're asking that of like, you know, an evolutionary biologist. I'm, I'm, the I'm evolution. asking about the linguistic side of it. Yeah, they're, they're crucially different. They're crucially different. Yeah. Um, it's like, and some of it is <clears throat> some of it is a, a difference of you know quality and another is a, a difference of uh, quantity um, <clears throat> we're just able to store a lot more information in our brains that we can access you know linguistically than any animal can um, and then also it's just kind of I guess the the elasticity uh the the that ability to analogize linguistically to to treat linguistic objects for for lack of a better term um to treat them the same way one would a physical object that seems to be the like the real the real block because it's like um even with uh you know the the gorillas who use sign language a lot of what they're doing is much more haphazard um than even a six-year-old would do um it's like they're they're learning uh, a certain number of signs that they get right a limited number but they're learning a, a certain mm -hmm. number and they're able to uh, kind of put them together but you know put them together in really random ways often a lot of like the like the gorilla sign language results are cherry picked whereas if you look at a lot of what their lexicon is they're saying things like you know like you know me banana now banana banana eat me now banana eat me you give, give banana banana and so on you know it's just like you can see the idea there and they're using the signs but they're not they're not making that next step and they just can't at this stage who knows you know animals keep evolving maybe they'll get there um but they're just not at the level that humans are okay julian uh anything else about language from your daughter as she grew up like in the first few years oh I, there there are oh there are so many interesting and fascinating things just uh you know just ways this that she has extended the meaning of words that make enough sense um but we just don't happen to do uh, and that's kind of like within the normal range of human variation like she uses um she uses the word spicy uh to refer to anything that she doesn't really like the taste of so like her uh she she just graduated from little kid toothpaste to adult toothpaste with the primary difference being that they're kind of assuming with the little kid toothpaste they're probably going to swallow it so it's not that you know harmful or, mm -hmm. or right whereas adult toothpaste you're really not supposed to swallow it so she refers to it as spicy toothpaste it's not you know really spicy she just knows she's not supposed to eat it um she refers to situations as spicy like dangerous situations are spicy uh and so it's like you know it's it's really cute it's nothing like that uh a human wouldn't do it's just something we don't necessarily um one of the one of the most fascinating things i ever saw was actually my little sister when she was young she did something that human beings are not supposed to be able to do but clearly 
she did it and others do it all the time, which is contract in places where you're not supposed to contract in English. So in other words, you could say uh, he is going to the store or he's going to the store. Uh, but you should say, be able to say, I don't know who he's, that should be impossible. It mm -hmm. should just, you should only be able to say, I don't know who he is, but that's exactly what she did. We were playing with a little stuffed animal and I was hiding it. And so I was saying, where, where, where is, where is he? Where, where did your, where did your stuffed animal go? And she said, I don't know where he's. And I was like, oh my, that was supposed to be impossible. That was supposed to be something that no child, no, a mistake, no child would ever make. There's a lot of research that's actually, actually banking on the fact that no child would ever make that mistake. Um, you know, with the whole innateness and universal grammar hypotheses, but it's like, no, they do. <laughs> they do. Maybe not as commonly, but they do. Um, Makes sense. You have to yeah. unlearn it rather than learn it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Makes sense. Um, so <laughs> we got off on tangents, but they're really fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, so once you found the community, how did you? Uh, move on from there. How did, how, um, how did continue? Well, I you know I finished my my BA in linguistics and went on to graduate school in in linguistics, um, and uh, and I continued uh, creating languages the entire time, you know, uh, and got better and better. I learned a lot actually. Uh, I, there were a couple of key classes I took from Farrell Ackerman in graduate school that really helped me get better as a language creator. Yeah, that wasn't the intent of those classes, but that was the upshot. Um, and uh, and then at that point, uh, my wife had decided she didn't want to complete graduate school, which I understood because I wasn't keen on being in there in the first place. And mm -hmm. so um, when we left, I found a job teaching English at the community college, just uh, composition, freshman composition. Um, and I did that for two years. I continued to create languages, of course, and enjoy it. Um, and uh, but the the job was not what I hoped for. I made about nineteen thousand dollars a year and worked about ninety hours a week. Um, so it wasn't uh, that wasn't ideal. Um, so then um, I quit for a while. My wife began working as a wedding planner. And I, I worked on a novel. This was a third one. I finished it. I wasn't happy with it. So I shelved it. Uh, and then I was doing nothing for a few months. Um, and then out of the blue, uh, uh, Dan Weiss, the producer of Game of Thrones, contacted the Language Creation Society looking for somebody to create Dothraki. Oh. Um, I thought yeah, it would be it was... like steps in between. Nope. No? None. Absolutely none. It came out of the blue. There was nothing that anybody did. It was just one day. It was not a thing. And the next day it was a thing. Um, the Language Creation Society put together a competition to see who would, you know, be chosen to uh, create, create the language. And so I participated in that competition with many other language creators uh, and I won it. And so after that, I was the, you know, the language creator on Game of Thrones. And how was that experience? Like, what did they want from you? Did they say, uh, we the want these sentences, or do you want to invent the language first? Or? The competition was very poorly designed um, and quite brutal uh, because they did ask for specific things. Um, however, there was no upper limit on the amount of material that you could provide. Um, and uh, not only by amount, but quality, uh, you know, the what you could do. And so what that meant, what I realized when I read those instructions was that this competition was going to become a cold war and it was going to be a matter of who could do the most that was the best. Hmm. Uh, and so I, I was determined that that was going to be me. Um, so it was like the first half of the competition was only about two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks. Um, and I put together 180 pages of material, um, which was oh. most, yeah, it was a, a good chunk of the Dothraki language grammar and, and dictionary, 
plus a whole bunch of translated material and extra material. Um, then I moved on to the finals. And then so for the finals, we had an, about another two weeks. Um, I increased the amount of material I had to over 300 pages of material. Um, and that was a lot as the most work I'd ever done in that amount of time. Did I you think, get any but, notes from above or did they just say nice and move on? Uh, there were there were some notes from the first round that I that I responded to because the first round was judged by other language creators and I and I used those and it was very valuable. Um, the second round was going to be judged by the producers, uh, so my goal was to produce as much material that was as high quality as I could make it. I was as linguistically dense as possible, uh, so that essentially that they would feel bad not giving me the job. Um, mm. And then to like, I gave them a little one pager that said some things that, you know, they would find impressive, but that were technically meaningless. Like uh, I wrote down what the longest word in Dothraki is, didn't mean anything. Um, and then like said that the Dothraki had a bunch of words for horse and, and carry and pull and things like that, but didn't have a word for please. Um, and so they, you know, that, that was just one page, really easy to read. So I had that plus 300 pages of material. And then a plus, of course, I also had the audio recording so they could hear what it sounded like, which was important, but that I was fairly confident about. Um, and so, yeah, I put all that together, sent it off and and I won it. And did you base it on, did you have knowledge of Game of Thrones or did you just say- I had the, yeah. I had the books, my, my wife had the books. Uh, and so what I was able to do was go through all of the Daenerys chapters and find all the words of Dothraki and put them together. So yeah, the, uh, everything I created was based on that. There were only about, I think there were 56 words total. Most of them were names. Uh, and then there were some, there were like three or four sentences. Uh, and so I was able to analyze those grammatically and make sure that the grammar I created fit with all of that. I incorporated all of his words uh, and used the the phonological shape of those words to help determine the uh, phonological character of the language. Uh, and so I did that. Um, and yeah, I just uh, built and built and built. Um, and, and did it become it. a living thing? Like once they took uh, the documents you created and used them, did they, was there like feedback? Did they come with a new, you know, for this episode, we need this, for this episode, we need that. Yeah, I essentially uh, continued to work as a translator on the show. So they just told me what needed to be translated and I translated it. Yeah. All right, and how long did you work for them? Uh, 10 years. Wow. And along the way came other opportunities, right? Yeah, pretty much as soon as Game of Thrones aired. It wasn't long after that that the next opportunity came along. Um, you know, Game of Thrones really had a big cultural impact. And so it wasn't just me. It was everybody that worked on the show. Um, and they were being hired to do other stuff. Um, and so, so yeah, like, uh, I think the first one was a movie called Noah that I wanted to be sure somebody else got that job because you know, it wouldn't have been fair if I took all of them. So I I ran the competition for, for the movie Noah and got that job for somebody else named Bill Weldon. Um, unfortunately, the created language elements were cut from the film, which was a real bummer, but he did get paid, so that was good. Um, and then, um, yeah, after that, the next show was Defiance on Sci-Fi, which to date is still my favorite project. It's an amazing. It had a few languages. It had a few, yeah. Yeah, I created four full languages for that. Four writing systems. I visited the set uh, multiple times. Uh, had you know knew all of the cast and worked with the. I knew a lot of the writers. I knew the art department. It was that was a really wonderful experience. And and what I had been hoping for from Game of Thrones that I really didn't get that it was just remote and I barely met anybody. You know. Mm. How does the cast? How do actors learn the language? Like, they have to sound real when they say it. And, you know, I have an accent. I have to think about, can you understand what I'm saying? And I say, I speak, it makes it harder if you don't speak your own 
uh, language, or if you're self-aware, I mean, self-conscious uh, of uh, yeah. not being completely true. So how, how do you get them over that? Uh, well, I mean, I just record every single line and they just listen and repeat. Uh, for the most part, they do a pretty good job, you know? Like, so they don't, there's not really a learning process. It's it's just like, you know, I, I, I take every single line they're gonna do, like, you know, uh, is uh, <laughs> one line that for, for Drogo, right? It's like, how do you know? And so it's like, you know, I, I give them line as I think it should be said, you know, in real time, you know, <laughs> and then I slow it down and say, <laughs> right? And then I give them that. And then they just work with it because, you know, everybody can get MP3s on their phone, you know? Sure. So I think the hardest, the hardest thing in learning a language you don't know and you don't really want to speak it and you don't have enough time is the stresses where do you put the stresses uh, yeah because i know i'm trying to learn french and i don't know i'm at the stage where i don't know i know where i would put this if it was english but they put wow. it somewhere else uh french is easy just throw it at the end <laughs> so <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, you know, like I, I, would I be able to slow it down like that? They, they hear it pretty clearly. And then of course there's also the, the visual because, you know, they, I give them the written lines and break it down syllable by syllable and put, you know, in all caps where the, uh, where the main stress is supposed to be, or, or at least where the higher pitch is supposed to be if there's multiple uh, throughout, the, throughout the course of the sentence. Um, it seems to work out okay. And do you take those languages and other languages you invented that don't belong to someone else uh, and then use them with friends, with your kids, with your wife, uh, so other people won't understand, <laughs> or <laughs> it's a way to let it grow. Nah, I'm just too lazy for that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know. It would take effort. It would take a lot of effort. For me, I, f I always feel better learning a language if I can take a class. If I can't take a class, then, you know, um, I, I, I'm not really, I'm not really going to be learning it very easily. So, um, so yeah, I just leave that. I just leave that be. Um, I, the, the thing that I really derive pleasure from is creating them and then creating more words for them. Um, that's what I like the most. And so, even in my spare time, that's just what I do. It's amazing. So what, how do you see this? How do you see yourself? Like, what, what's your path forward? Um, hmm. Well, I, I keep getting work. And so I'm going to keep doing that for a time. I, I want to get back to writing fiction. Because that's that's what I really love, but uh, the nice thing of late is that I have been, I found a partner uh, in language creation. Um, I began working with her on a show called Motherland Fort Salem, which is airing its uh, second season right now, uh, and I've started. Uh, we started doing all future projects together. This is uh, Jesse Sams, who is. Uh, linguistics professor at Stephen F. Austin University and who's also a language creator. Um, and working working with her is more fun than working by myself right now. And so um, and so yeah, right now it's it's kind of like reinvigorated my own work um, because I, I look forward to I look forward to new projects now because it's it's both easier working together and it's a lot more fun. Um, and uh, we we actually we have we created a a YouTube series together where we we create a language live you know incrementally uh, two hours a week so that others can kind of see what the process is like you know um, and learn from it uh, and that's that's been that's been a lot of fun. How are people reacting to it? Like, what kind of comments do you get? Oh, we have people that watch it live. Uh, we get between, you know, depending on the week, between 30 and 60 uh, people watching, you know, which is not like, it's not like a Twitch streamer or something, but it's pretty good for, you know, creating a language, right? 
Um, and they're, and they're, they're really engaged, you know, while we're doing it. Um, and so, yeah, like it's just a lot of fun. And, you know, sometimes they, I think it, especially for language creators, um, it was helpful to see the process and helpful to see that we also get stuck sometimes mm -hmm. and we make mistakes and we go back and we fix them because I think, especially with the younger language creators who, who are not keyed into the old communities that I, I was a part of. So like, didn't ever interact with me. Like all they see is that I create languages for shows and they see them on the shows and think, well, that's, that's really, that's really amazing. I could never do that. Or it's like, it's so professional. Like, I think it's easier for them to see that. No, no, we still, we still messed it up a lot. It still work, you know? Mm. Sounds like basically you, your walk is like playing with Legos, like as a kid or something. <laughs> playing with whatever oh, yeah. you like. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that's really what my work is. If you want to sum it up in a single word, it's play and I love it. It's great. <laughs> sounds, sounds amazing. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming and talking with us. And uh, it was great. Well, thank you for having me. I was happy to do it. So... <laughs>